This is the Architect Exam Podcast, the official podcast of the Young Architect Academy. I'm your host, Layla, and today we're talking about something that might sound dry on the paper, but is actually super important and even a little fascinating, occupancy classifications. I remember when I first started studying for the ARE, occupancy classifications seemed so boring on paper. But then I was working on a renovation project where we were converting an old warehouse into a mixed-use building with a restaurant and apartments. Suddenly, all these occupancy rules mattered. We had to completely rethink our design because of how Group A, a restaurant, and Group R, residential requirements, differed from the original group, which was storage. That's when it clicked for me. Occupancies aren't just code letters. They're about keeping real people safe in real buildings. Imagine if we treated a crowded theater the same as an empty warehouse in terms of safety. That wouldn't make sense, right? That's exactly why we have occupancy classifications in the building code. Today, we're going to keep things light and fun as we explore the 10 different occupancy classifications in the International Building Code. Think of this episode as your roadmap to understanding how the building code categorizes the spaces where we live, work, and play. Now, before we dive in, I do want to mention that if you're studying for the ARE, we cover this topic in much more detail in our Codes 101 course at the Young Architect Academy. That course includes 180 code-specific practice questions and 175 flashcards, all organized from beginner to intermediate to hard to help you progress. So if you want to really master this topic after our overview today, that's your next step. All right, let's get started. So what are occupancy classifications? At its core, an occupancy classification is simply how buildings are categorized based on their primary use. The building code uses these classifications to apply the right safety requirements to different types of spaces. It's really about tailoring safety to specific uses and risks. Think about your own home for a second. So we don't cook in bathrooms or sleep in garages, right? Different rooms serve different purposes and have different safety requirements. The building code works in the same way, just on a larger scale. Occupancy classification is the foundation for virtually all other code requirements. Once you know a building's occupancy, you can determine things like how tall can a building be? How many exits does it need? What kind of fire protection are we required to have? And how accessible it needs to be? Getting the occupancy classification wrong can lead to real safety issues. So let's say if you design a nightclub, which is an assembly occupancy with the same safety standards as an office building, which is a B occupancy, you could have a dangerous situation when hundreds of people try to leave in an emergency. So let's take a look at how occupancy classifications affect different aspects of building design. First, building size, height, and area. A hospital, for example, has different size limits than a storage facility because they have different risks and different number of occupants. The code might allow a warehouse to be much larger than a daycare center of the same construction type. Next, exits and egress. A theater needs more exits than an office of the same size because it has more people who might not be familiar with the building. The code requires wide corridors, more doors, and special hardware like panic bars in certain occupancies to help people get out quickly in case of an emergency. Fire protection is a big one too. Buildings where people sleep need earlier warnings about fire, which is why residential occupancies have strict smoke alarm requirements. High hazard occupancies might need specialized sprinkler systems designed for the specific risks they present. Accessibility requirements also vary. So public buildings like libraries or courthouses have stricter accessibility standards than say, if you're looking at a private storage facility with few visitors. To visualize this, imagine a 5,000 square foot space. If it's designed as a restaurant, you need multiple wide exits, a fire sprinkler system, accessible restrooms, and an occupant load calculated at maybe one person per 15 square feet. Looking at that same space as an office might only need two exits, possibly no sprinklers, depending on the building. 
and would be calculated at one person per 150 square feet. So that's a huge difference between the two. You're listening to the Architect Exam Podcast, your guide to passing the A-R-E. Now let's take a quick tour through the 10 major occupancy groups. For each one, I'll give you a simple definition, some examples, and key safety concerns. We'll start with group A, which is assembly. So group A is for places where people gather in groups. So you wanna think theaters, restaurants, churches, stadiums, and concert halls. The key safety concerns here are large crowds, the potential for panic during emergencies, and the need for multiple exits. So imagine a packed concert venue. If there's a fire, how do 500 people get out quickly and safely? That's why assembly occupancies have such strict requirements for exit, aisle width, and often require sprinkler systems. Assembly is actually split into subgroups. So they have from A1 through A5 based on the specific type of assembly. But we don't need to get into that detail today. The second group is group B, which stands for business. So group B covers places where people work and conduct business. Your typical offices, banks, doctor's offices, and post offices. The key concern here are moderate occupant loads in spaces where people are generally familiar with their surroundings. Think of your typical office building where people know the layout and aren't packed together like they would be in a theater. One important thing to note, and this confuses a lot of people, is that higher educational facilities are considered business occupancy and not educational. So when you think about colleges and university buildings, they fall under the group B and not E. The next occupancy type is group E, which stands for educational. So group E is for places where children learn, specifically through the 12th grade. So this includes K-12 and daycares for older children. Now, the main safety concern for this one is that you have young occupants who need guidance in emergencies. So imagine 25 kindergartners during a fire alarm, they need clear directions and safe exits. That's why educational occupancies have specific requirements for fire drills, emergency planning, and often sprinkler systems. But I do want you to remember that colleges, again, are group B and not group E. So educational stops at 12th grade. The next group is group F, which stands for factory. So group F covers places where things are made or fabricated. This includes factories, workshops, and even dry cleaners. Some of the key safety concerns are gonna include machinery hazards, industrial processes, and potential fire risk from production activities. Think about the safety differences between a small craft brewery versus a large furniture factory. Both are making products, but with very different hazards. Factory is divided into F1, which is moderate hazard, and F2, which is low hazard, depending on the combustibility of the materials being used. The next group we have is group H, which stands for high hazard. So group H is for places with dangerous materials. Think about chemical plants or firework storage facilities and places that handle explosives or toxic substances. The key concern, as you might guess, are explosion risks, toxic releases, and severe fire hazards. These are the buildings with the hazmat symbols that firefighters worry about. Group H has the most restrictive code requirements of any occupancy group, including special ventilation systems, explosion-resistant construction, and strict limitations on building size. The next group that we're going to talk about is Group I, which stands for institutional. Now, Group I covers places where people receive care or are detained. This is going to include hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and prisons. The main safety concern for this group is that many occupants have limited mobility or are dependent on others for evacuation. So patients in hospital beds can't run downstairs in an emergency, which is why institutional occupancies often require features like smoke compartments, areas of refuge, and staffing plans for evacuation. Group M is for mercantile. So Group M is for places where things are sold. So stores, markets, and shopping centers. 
The key safety concerns for this group includes customers who are unfamiliar with exits and high fire loads from merchandise. So picture a busy department store during holiday shopping, lots of people and products, which creates a need for clear exits and often sprinkler systems. The next occupancy group is Group R, which stands for residential. So Group R covers places where people sleep, houses, departments, hotels, university dormitories, or any other residential uses. Now, the biggest safety concern for Group R is that sleeping occupants are really slow to respond to an alarm. Most fire deaths happen in homes because people are asleep when fire starts. And that's why residential occupancies require smoke alarms, carbon monoxide detectors in many cases, and increasingly residential sprinkler systems. We also have Group S. Group S stands for storage. So Group S is for places where things are stored, warehouses, parking garages, and self-storage facilities. Now, what are the key concerns for storage occupancy? It includes high fire loads and potentially few people to notice a fire. So imagine a large warehouse with tall stacks of stored goods and only a few workers. A fire could grow quite large before can anyone can notice it. That's why storage occupancies often need fire detection systems and sometimes specialized sprinklers. Finally, Group U, which stands for utility, covers miscellaneous structures that don't fit other categories. Things like sheds, detached garages, barns, and fences over six feet high. These generally have low occupancy and minimal requirements. It's the catch-all category for those simple structures with few occupants. Let's talk about some real-world scenarios where occupancy classifications make a big difference. Imagine converting a warehouse, which is Group S, into a restaurant, which is Group A2. Suddenly, you need more exits, wider doors with panic hardware, a fire alarm system, and probably sprinklers and accessibility features like accessible restrooms. Now, the occupant load jumps dramatically too. So from maybe a dozen warehouse workers to potentially hundreds of diners. Or consider adding a daycare to an office building. That part of the building would change from group B to group E, requiring different fire separations, probably a dedicated exit and specialized safety features for the children. Here's a common confusion point. So small assembly spaces. When is a conference room group B versus group A? The answer really depends on the occupant load. If it holds fewer than 50 people, it can remain classified as part of the business occupancy. But as soon as you hit that 50 person threshold, it becomes group A. So 50 people in a restaurant makes it a group A2, but 49 people could keep it as group B. That's a big difference in requirements for just one person. Let's talk about mixed use buildings. So many buildings serve multiple purposes, and the code has ways to handle these mixed-use situations. Think of a building with shops on the ground floor and apartments above. The shops are Group M, which is mercantile, and the apartments are Group R, which is residential. There are two main approaches to handling this. So one is separation, using fire barriers between different occupancies to essentially create separate buildings stacked together. The other approach is applying the stricter requirement of each occupancy throughout the entire building. It's like having different neighborhoods in a city, each with their own rules. Sometimes you build walls between neighborhoods, like a separation, and sometimes you just apply the strictest rules to everyone, which is a non-separation. Before we wrap up, let's clear up some common misconceptions. First, not every room gets its own classification. Small supporting spaces are considered accessory to the main occupancy. So a storage closet in an office doesn't really mean that it's going to become a Group S. It remains part of the Group B occupancy. We already mentioned that educational stops at 12th grade. Colleges are business occupancies. The importance of occupant load calculations can't be overstated. Many occupancy-related requirements depend on how many people will be in the space, so getting this right is crucial. For remembering key distinctions, try these associations. Assembly, A, is for audience. Business, B, is for busy workers. Educational, E, elementary school. 
Factory F is for fabrication. High hazard H is for hazardous. Institutional I for incapacitated or incarcerated. Mercantile M can remember it as merchandise. Residential R resting slash sleeping. Storage S stuff. Utility U unoccupied mostly. So these are easy ways to try to remember these occupancy types. So what have we learned today? Occupancy classifications are the building codes way of ensuring that safety is tailored to use. Different activities present different risks and the code accounts for that. Understanding occupancies is just the first step in code compliance, but it's a crucial one because it sets the stage for everything else. In a future episode, we'll talk about separations between occupancies in in more detail, which is another really fascinating topic. I encourage you to practice identifying occupancies in buildings you visit. Look around you in your current space. What occupancy are you in right now? Think about a building undergoing a renovation in your area. How might occupancy changes affect the design? What occupancy would you classify your favorite restaurant or store? And remember, If you want to dive deeper into this topic, check out our Codes 101 course on the Young Architect Academy. Those 180 practice questions and 175 flashcards are going to really help you solidify your understanding. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep designing with safety in mind. Thanks for listening to the Architect Exam Podcast. Ready to take your studying to the next level? Visit our online ARE Architecture School website at academy.youngarchitect.com to learn more about how we can help you. See you next time.